Welcome to the Seeing Red Podcast with Andy Turner and Garrett Fools, checking up on Texas policies and politics with some federal issues thrown in, like the assault weapons ban, interest rate hikes, you get it, but it's mostly Texas, since we can't ignore the big stuff either. And now, here are your hosts, Andy Turner and Garrett Fools. Hey everybody, welcome back to this week's edition of Seeing Red. We are delighted you all have joined us and we have a very, very special guest, um, Matt Makoviak, who is chairman of the Travis County Republicans. He ran for RPT chair. Um, He may or may not remember me, which is okay because he meets all the people all the time, but I met Matt early, early on and he was one of the very first people to make me feel welcome, even though we may or may not agree on every single solitary piece of policy, he was amazing. I felt welcomed and invited and would you come and like this and that and the other thing. And it was just an amazing experience. And Matt, you really do represent all shades of red. I mean, you do it well. You have your own personal beliefs. And I think that is so key, but you keep in mind that, you know, the Reagan thing, eight of 10 issues and we can work together. So um, anyway, Garrett, I know you have something you want to say. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Matt. You know, I was, I lived in Travis County for a couple of years, went to a lot of your EC meetings. I was always, uh, impressed with how well you managed uh, the parliamentary procedure of just getting through some of these uh, county meetings, which can sometimes be fraught with just people trying to do some wacky things. And you always make sure to stick to the party business. And it seemed like you did a good job of um, making Republicans relevant in Travis County, which is a hard task to do. um, If you know anything about the demographics of Travis County. So uh, what kind of, uh, what got you into the RPT chair race? And then kind of talk, talk a little bit about what, what was happening at convention this past week. Absolutely. Well, Andy, thank you for saying that. I do remember you, and it's been a little while. I appreciate oh. you saying that. You know, as Travis County GP uh, chair now in my seventh year, we don't have the luxury of hand-selecting which Republicans we like and don't like. Um, we got to be about addition and not subtraction. And so I've understood that from the beginning. I was a precinct chair, and then I was vice chair. Uh, and then I was been chair now for seven years, elected, uh, what, three months after Trump got elected in 2016. So um, I do try to try to take a broad approach to how we build the party in Travis County. Uh, I realize that's not always in fashion, you know, in different political circles at the moment. Um, but, you know, as, as I think you said at the beginning, as Reagan said, my 80 percent friend is not my 20 percent enemy. Um, and, you know, you try to achieve the most conservative outcome that you can. Uh, and if you don't get everything you want, then you try to do that afterwards. And that's how you move the ball down the field. You know, if you don't move the ball down the field, you're not making any progress. I don't see purity uh, as a as a as a virtue. Uh, certainly not if if purity comes at the expense of, of of getting an outcome. You know, when you work in politics and when you work in government, um, you have to be measured by results, not measured by intentions. Correct. And certainly not measured measured by purity. Now, Garrett, thank you um, for your for your question. You and I go back. I know back to when you worked on Abbott's campaign. I've been certainly aware of you for a long time. Appreciate all you do as well. Look, uh, you know, this, this the chapter in my memoir that surrounds the RPT chair campaign is going to be a doozy. Um, and every time I talk to someone about this, I have to think about how much I want to reveal. Um, I've had I've had deep concern about Republican Party of Texas for five years. Um, the simple fact is four of the last seven state chairs have been totally inadequate. Um, and I would include Tina Benkaiser and Kathy Adams on the front end, uh, who ran into the ground before Steve Mysteri took it over and saved it. Uh, and then I would include, of course, Alan West and now Mount Rinaldi on the back end. Um, and I start from the perspective of Texas being the biggest and most successful red state in the country for 20 years. And if that's true, then we ought to have the best funded, most sophisticated, most mature, most responsible, most outstanding state party in the country year after year after year after year. And the fact that we don't is something that enrages me personally. And it's something that all of us who care about this stuff should be unwilling to accept. Now, just because you're unwilling to accept something doesn't mean you should charge, you know, full into uh, a kamikaze mission. And so uh, to answer your question, I, I, 
I took a I took a three or four month what I would call stealth or even due diligence effort to explore running for chair. And to be candid with you, that effort really all along had one requirement, and that was Trump's endorsement. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons why I thought that was important. Uh, and I spent a lot of time really doing two things, well, maybe three things. One, building political support among people who rely on the state party, that statewide elected officials, members of Congress, legislative candidates, consultants, advisors, uh, organizations in downtown Austin and across the state. Um, mm-hmm. and, and in terms of that, 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 that realm, there was 100% acceptance and encouragement with me. Second is I wanted to build, given how, how absolutely disastrous the financial situation is at the state party right now, I wanted to build a very significant uh, money machine effectively so that you could raise a million dollars the first week and two to three million dollars over 30 to 45 days uh, and so in the end, I, I built a universe of about 200 significant Texans across the spectrum, across, you know, from Amarillo to South Texas, from El Paso to Texarkana, of people that pledged uh, $2.5 million to the party over, uh, only 77 of them were representing that number. So it's not even the whole list that, that were committing that amount of money over a 30 day period if I was elected chair. And it's not about me being special. It's about someone they can trust, someone they believe is going to lead the party in a productive, positive direction. Uh, and would run an organization with integrity uh, and with seriousness. Um, and, and so it's actually a fairly low bar, not a fairly high bar. But third, that Trump endorsement was really crucial. And I don't know how to say this any more clearly than, than, than the, the way that I'll say it now. Uh, in the end, I got as close to a Trump endorsement as you can possibly get without getting it. Someday I will, tell the, whole, someday I will tell the whole story. Uh, you would lose all your hair. You would lose your lunch. You would be weeping. Um, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I'm not being hyperbolic. Uh, what happened to me, the treachery and savagery in that regard, uh, is Shakespearean. And so, uh, I don't mean to be mysterious. Um, I have no. to, uh, I have to be careful about what I reveal and the way I reveal it in the, in the, in the manner. But what I will say is, um, one of the four top statewide officials in our state called me two weeks ago and encouraged me to get into this race, knowing full well, I did not have Trump's endorsement. But that person made the case to me that I was the strongest candidate, I was the best fundraiser, I was the best communicator, that the field was weak, um, and that the uh, front runner Abraham George was, quote unquote, totally unacceptable, a phrase that is not a phrase I've heard used only by one person. Um, I launched into basically a 48-hour period to seriously explore whether I could get in and put the pieces together at the last minute. Um, and I will just say that the Trump endorsement was uh, very live at that point. And uh, it was something that was very, very close. I probably traveled, let's call it 90 yards of the football field by myself, got down to the 10 yard line. And as I was about to score, I was effectively tackled by my own offensive lineman. So some of you out there might, might be able to guess uh, what happened here. Some of you won't. For now, I'm not going to probably get into it more than that. I'll just say that um, in the end, um, you know, we certainly thought that was a live option. Now, even without Trump's endorsement, I ran to win. Um, in the end, I didn't lose because a majority of the delegates chose someone else. Uh, while, while that is technically true, in this case, they, the, what, what happened is I had a week to, to convince up to 7,000 el- eligible delegates that I was the right choice. You cannot build a statewide organization in that time. And I knew that there were limitations. Uh, yeah. My hope was that I was going to be able to get into uh, the, the sort of the finale and become the consensus choice against Abraham George. My primary goal here was to deny him the chairmanship. Uh, because I believe he is uh, morally unfit for this office. I think he is professionally, really? uh, absolutely. I can, we can get into this if you want. He's morally unfit. He's professionally, um, uh, let's call it unproven, uh, uh, or I would say disqualified almost, um, and, and really is not going to be able to do this job in the way that he needs to do it. I don't even think he realizes the deal with the devil that he's made. He'll realize it quickly. Um, but, but in the end, uh, for me, the motivation was this. I believe that we have to have Trump win Texas by the largest margin possible. The last four election cycles, we've gone from 14 to 11 to 9 to 5.6 in terms of the margin at the presidential level in Texas. That tells me that on that trajectory, you could have a 3% win. And in that scenario, Ted Cruz loses. There's a libertarian on the ballot that will get 1% to 1.5% if Ted Cruz loses. In a scenario where the Democrats have Biden, uh, a Democratic House majority, and a Democratic Senate majority, the filibuster is gone and we'll lose the country in two years. They'll pack the Supreme Court. They'll add two or three new states crazy gun control, crazy uh, climate change, all kinds of other things. So in terms of what motivated me, just to wrap up on your question, uh, it was trying to eliminate or try to minimize minimize to the largest extent possible the risk of, of, of that all happening. 
Um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna figure this out. Give me one gonna, second. No, while you while you figure that out, let me let me just chat a little bit. So I, um, Matt, you may not remember, but I came from well, a state that is very much like Austin, right? It's very blue, and I thank you all for having me here in Texas. I ran screaming out of a place I had lived for a very very long time. But I was very involved in Republican politics when I was there. Um, I was, you know, county chair and I was on the executive board for the Maryland Federation. So I had a lot of experience with this. And when I saw, if I'd known you were going to run, I would have gone and been a delegate. But nobody knew. So it was too late. But I've, run, I've worked on a campaign where the decision was made. It was a congressional campaign. The decision was made not with two leagues, but, but, in terms of a campaign cycle, a very short, short amount of time. Um, and, and, you know, I was saying to Garrett while we were watching what was going on, you know, with Twitter and this and that, the other thing, I was like, I was like, okay, so he's got to throw all the money at this and he's got to get the message out. He's got it. And like, you did that. You absolutely did that. You, you said, I'm going to run and you threw everything you had at it. And, Unfortunately, in the congressional race, we there was a different strategy that I didn't get to choose. <laughs> um, but I'm not a candidate, so you know. Um, but but yeah, so that was a very complicated issue, and so choosing to run at the last minute is, man, you better. And, and that's what I said to Garrett. He better hit the ground. I mean, running like Full running. Start. Yeah, I mean, there's no jogging here, and like. Even I was getting your text messages, which meant that you were not afraid to spend all the money. And I was so proud of you for um, for how you ran this campaign, at least not being in San Antonio. But from everything that I could see, you absolutely understand what leadership means. And particularly when you're chair of the RPT or any state uh, Republican Party. You got to raise the money. You got to get Republicans elected, and you got to and and, and got to get Republicans to the polls. You got to get them. You don't register here, but you got to get them to the polls, pulling those Republican ballots. And you have always understood that. So when I heard you were running, I was like, "Yes, please, yes!" <laughs> Would have been so awesome. So I'm Matt. really sorry, but I, you did say something. Hang one second, Garrett. I wanted to follow up with something. Um, so Matt, if I understood correctly, you had said something about Abraham George, and I don't know the gentleman. I he could knock on my door, and I wouldn't have a clue who he is. But if I understood you correctly, you had said something about that there were moral issues with him, and and I wondered, did you want to expand on that, or you just want to leave that alone for now? No, I, I will. And look, I I, I kind of take the Martin Luther King view that it's always the right time to do the right thing. I think I might have misquoted him on Twitter the other day when I said that it's, it's never the wrong time to do the right thing, which is, a, I think, a false quote that's been attributed to him. But it's basically the same point. Look, mm -hmm. if you believe someone is morally unacceptable for a high office, and I consider the state party chair position of, of RPT a high office, I don't really think you should shy away from saying that. And, and this is not rumor. It's not gossip. It's not, you know, fake news. It's none of that. This is based on original source documents, um, uh, some of which has been reported, much of which is, uh, is out there and not hard to find. But look, Abraham George has, has a number of problems. The first is he's never had any success in anything he's ever done. And that's that's just kind of true. I mean, that, you know, he was county chair in Collin County for two years. The only thing that mattered that happened while he was there is he lost one of five state house seats that was held by a Republican. And if you talk to people in Collin County, they'll tell you he did almost nothing to help. Second, Collin County weighed in into municipal races while he was there. And then they did almost nothing to actually help those candidates, almost all of whom lost. He decided to take that failure and decide to run for state house against the sitting State House member named Candy Noble. Uh, he lost 53-47 on March 4th. Three weeks later, after Matt Rinaldi admitted his own failures by de deciding not to run for another term, uh, he, he he announced four hours after Rinaldi got out. He did that with Ken Attorney, Attorney General Ken Paxton's endorsement, Rinaldi's endorsement, three or four state reps, and some of the Tim Dunn groups. So I start by saying, you know, it might be nice to have a state chair who's ever accomplished at least one thing of significance. But in terms, of, those aren't morally objectionable issues. Those are, those are, uh, that's a record of failure. The morally right. objectionable, yeah. yeah, the morally objectionable issues go, go in this regard. First of all, we know that he had a 911 call at his house about 15 months ago. This is reported in the Texas Tribune. Uh, he came home, listen, and I don't enjoy mentioning these things. I really don't. 
but, no, but these, I are now, these are now in the public record. And so I'm going to, I'm going to mention what's in the public record. Uh, he returned home, confronted his wife uh, for, uh, for infidelity. They got into an argument. Uh, he went and got a gun from his closet. He, uh, according to the police report and the 911 call, his six-year-old called 911, his six-year-old daughter called 911, um, concerned about what was going on at the house, about the argument they were having, about the fact that he had a gun in his hand. Uh, yeah. He apparently decided to want to leave the house to go confront the person she was cheating with. Presumably, or we believe this is someone that, that's from their church. Allegedly cheating with. Allegedly, Allegedly cheating with. That's right. That's right. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, and listen, infidelity affects all kinds of relationships. And so I'm, I'm sensitive mm -hmm. to that. And, and I have a heart for that couple. I hope that, that whatever they were going through is something they can get through. And, and uh, we all want that for anyone who's in a, a, couple, you know, a, a relationship, certainly in a marriage where they have a child. So, so you have this one incident at his house, and that's been reported. It got, got, I think it came out like four days after he announced he was running for state chair. Um, and so that's one incident. And I think a lot of us can have a heart for someone that might believe that their spouse is engaged in alleged uh, infidelity and getting into a disagreement about that, right? The question is, you know, is was there, you know, what, what was the what was the purpose of the gun? What was happening in the house? Why did the child feel scared? Uh, those are obviously, you know, significant things. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the first incident where he's had law enforcement involved or he's had behavioral problems. And this is just in the last two years alone. So the uh, the website Current Revolt had a has a letter from his church that his pastor sent to him about a year and a half ago, maybe maybe eight, maybe eighteen, maybe twenty months ago. That says a lot. I'm going to summarize it. The, the letter's out there. You can find it. Uh, the letter says Fair. that his behaviors Fair. become, yeah, his behaviors become a problem. He's asked him to reconcile with a number member of his church. Uh, he's refusing to do that. If he continues along this path, he's going to have to be asked not to attend the church anymore. A letter like that is not a first step. That is a step that happens down the road, right? Mm -hmm. After there have been incidents. Right? I am. That's like yeah. the third step in Christian like confrontation re resolution stuff. And that's look, guys. Let, let me get through this because that's not even it. Okay. We know that after that there was an incident where he punched a hole in the wall at his church and was uh, in small claims court. Um, and I think settled out of court. We also know there was another incident at his church after the letter. And this was, uh, this was about six months ago. Um, he got in an altercation with a man at his church. Police were called. Police showed up. He said, my name's Abraham George. You're looking for someone who has a name very similar to mine, but it's not me. He's in there. And the police go and look, and he leaves, and then nothing happens. Okay. And again, this is out there as well. This is not impossible to find. It would take a 21-year-old intern about four minutes to find it. There's a YouTube video that's out there, in fact, of the, of the body cam footage of the police officer. Um, there's another issue, which is, according to official documents, he's used three separate aliases, three, in the past 18 months. His legal name is Reggie N. Abraham, Reggie, R-E-J-I N. Abraham. He then changed his name to George N. Abraham. That's his father's name. Uh, and that name is actually on. Yes. Legally changed it yes. or. We believe we believe legally changed. It's on the deed to the first house that he and his wife lived in that his parents gave to them. Uh, he has most recently been changed his name to Abraham and George. Um, and and that's the name he used when he ran for county chair. It's the name he used when he ran for state rep. And it's the name he used when he ran for state chair. Look. People change their names. Dan Patrick's had a different name. Nikki Haley has a different birth name. There's nothing wrong with that. But using three separate names in an 18 year period is something you do if you're trying to obscure your past. And I mean, given these run-ins. It's one thing if you're a woman and you've gotten divorced or you've gotten yes. married. It's this, that, not the, the case thing. here. But, yeah, not the case yeah, here. So men don't yeah. generally change their name when they get married or divorced. No, and of course you don't do it over 18 months where you do it three times. And so um you know, look, these facts are going to come out now that he's state chair. Uh, they're going to come out because the media will have an interest in reporting them and the Democrats will have an interest in using them against him. Um, these are all things that, that key people knew beforehand. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I don't know that the, 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 so that the delegates knew all that, but I wish they had. Um, but but these are questions he needs to answer. Why has he used three aliases in 18 months? Uh, how many times has he interacted with law enforcement? Have there been other alleged domestic abuse incidents uh, related to, to his wife? What predated the church letter? Uh, did he give a false name to a police officer at the church incident? That's a very real question. Did he lie to a police officer? That's a felony. I mean, these are these are honest questions. And look, if he has good answers to all of them, I will come back on your podcast and on video, uh, apologize for this, 
take take responsibility for it and admit that he had good answers. Uh, well, what I, I think can, you're just yeah. asking questions. I mean, I don't think in, you, you've said allegedly and, you know, what we've seen from public documents and this and then the other thing. So I don't think you're out of line here. I think you're as as a county chair. I think you are within your rights to ask these questions. Yeah. And I, yeah. Okay, the, the last point I just want to make on this, Garrett, really quick is I, this is not about me feeling hurt that I lost and trying to go after him now. Um, I, I don't care who the chair is. And, and generally, I, I try not to work against the state chair. Um, in this case, I don't feel like I can work with him. I have absolutely no interest in getting to know him or be helpful. Um, and, and, and again, this isn't personal for me. It, to me, it's about all the things we all care about. It's about Ted Cruz's reelection and the future of the country. It's about John Devine's reelection to the Supreme Court. It's about Christy Craddock's reelection to railroad commissioner. It's about four courts of appeals, maybe six courts of appeals that have a handful of very competitive races. It's about all the races in South Texas from Monica de la Cruz and Myra Flores and our nominee against Henry Cuellar and all these other things that matter. Um, you know, in the end, it's pretty clear to me that Luke Macias and the Tim Dunn crowd did not vet their candidate. I know that's shocking to those of us who've worked with Luke over the years. Um, they didn't vet him. They ran someone at the last minute. They'd hoped David Covey would lose to Phelan and then he could run. But he got into a runoff. Um, they had hoped Rinaldi would run again. Rinaldi didn't run again because he, he and the attorney general worked very hard to get Trump's endorsement. And that was made impossible by Rinaldi's atrocious record. Uh, his open endorsement of DeSantis and his total lack of preparation for the state being ready for the most consequential presidential election in our lifetime. So, again, this may all seem like me complaining and whining and being upset I didn't succeed after a one year, excuse me, one week kamikaze mission to try to elect the state chair. In the end, uh, I have absolutely no interest in sitting back and letting people who don't care about building the party, who, in fact, want to shrink it, want to drown it in the bathtub because they're libertarians, risk everything we've all invested over a period of 10 or 20 or 30 years. I've bled for the Republican Party. I've bled for the conservative movement. I've had at least seven consequential victories in my own career, electing five members of Congress, um, electing um, Pete Flores in a seat that we hadn't won in a state Senate district in 100 years. Rush Limbaugh did a whole segment on it the day after we won in 2019, excuse me, 2021, uh, no, 2019, excuse me. Um, and, then the, and then, as you know, Garrett, as you were thinking about it, mentioning later, the, the Prop B success on reinstating the homeless camping ban. Uh, in May of 2021, which we did over the uh, opposition of nine out of 10 council members, the mayor, every Democratic official and every Democratic organization in Travis County, making Austin the first major American city to overturn a homeless camping ordinance and reinstate a homeless camping ban. So, you know, it's, it would seem to me you would hope the delegates would want someone who can raise money. Well, we had two point five million dollars pledged from 77 people. You'd see me want someone you'd see it seem you'd want someone who's actually had some success at some level. I've been a county chair. I've won big races, including uphill battles. Uh, and it would seem you want someone who might be able to unify the party, who's acceptable to the grassroots, but who also doesn't isn't radioactive to the donor base so that you can bring everyone together to make sure Trump wins by the largest margin possible. And 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 we've said this before on the show. I am not on certain issues. I am not hard, hard right. I consider myself a Reagan Republican. And you knew that when we met and you look out for because if you are whether it's Travis County, the state of Texas, you represent all the Republicans. And that's right. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what leadership is. And so I am like, I didn't know anything before we sat down today about Abraham George, like nothing. So um, I, but I think, Garrett, you're you're from around Collin County. Yeah. Yeah, I'm from Grayson. I, my dad served as a uh, precinct chair in Collin while Abraham was on the SREC. And then I think when he was ultimately elected by the CEC, I don't remember if, how my dad voted, but I don't think it particularly mattered at that time. But um, yeah. Matt, I do have one last question because I know you have to you have to run. Um, and I'll, it's one real question and one kind of just a, a pitch to you. The one thing is you said you had 2.5 in pledges. Do you think there's any way Abraham George will be able to raise that kind of money um, from anyone other than Tim Dunn and, and and Wilkes? And do you think that they will actually provide any funding to the party um, sub, a, of a substantial nature to actually help? Um, and after that, kind of where can people find more information about you and the stuff you're working on currently, um, et cetera? Yeah, I appreciate that. And I've got about five more minutes, so we can keep going if, if there's a follow-up. But look, first, first, first answer to your question is, 
there was such a thirst for people who wanted to have someone they could trust as state party chair to, to help make sure everyone's pulling in the same direction after what is the most divisive primary and primary runoff in my lifetime, that this is the easiest sales pitch I've ever had in my life. And it's not because I'm special. It's again, because they want someone they can trust who's an adult who will run the party the right way. I wanted to take Steve Unisteri's model and mm -hmm. kind of bring the 21st century technology to it and get us to a totally different, get us to a totally different level. Um, so, uh, you know, in terms of the money, look, Tim Dunn basically owns the state party. Uh, we, we know that he's rented it effectively or he's leasing it. Um, if he owns it and if he cares about it, then he needs to fund it. And that's not enough to just keep the lights on so that you can have four paid staff representing a state of 30 million people. Um, you, you know, you need to have 40 or 50 staff right now. You need to be actually registering voters. Not Rinaldi hasn't registered one voter at the RPT since he's been state chair. We have a thousand people a day moving to Texas, most of whom are moving here because they're conservative, they're Republican, they want liberty and they want right. low taxes, right? So it is the lowest hanging fruit you can possibly have. Um, so look, if they decide to fund the party in a significant way and focus on November, uh, I'll, I'll give them a Glock golf clap. Not going to happen. It's simply not going to happen. These are people that want to win primaries. They don't care at all about general elections. They haven't shown any interest in, in, in general elections, which again, primaries don't elect anyone. They give someone a chance to represent our party on a ballot position that this party has worked for 150 years to secure, long before Tim Dunn ever drilled his first oil well. So, you know, from my standpoint, um, you know, uh, the party matters. You know, are we able to run a cut rate postage program through BRM that the campaigns and the candidates can, can rely on to save the money on mail? Are we able to do an EVBM program, an early vote by mail program? If we don't, Trump's going to get killed in the mail ballots in Texas. While he'll still win Texas, his margin will be very narrow. We saw what a three-point margin at the top of the ticket does. In 2018, yeah. when Ted Cruz won Texas by 2.7%, we lost 12 state house seats, two state senate seats, two congressional seats. Every Republican judicial candidate in Houston lost. We lost majorities, I think, on two or three of the courts of appeals. It was a decade-long uh, disaster for us electorally in one night. And so, you know, I'm unwilling to sit back with whatever power or, or resources or ingenuity or work ethic or experience or network or skill I possess. I am willing to sit back, unwilling to sit back and say, good luck, guys. Um, I don't think you can work through RPT right now. I don't think the donors are going to fund it. I don't think 95 of the top 100 donors in Texas that haven't given five grand to the party in five years are going to come back. Yeah. I think they're going to work through the candidates directly. I think they're going to work through NRCC at the congressional level. I think they may work through the lieutenant governor or or uh, maybe the speaker, depending who the speaker is or where things stand uh, at the House level. Uh, and it may be groups like ART and TLR and other groups. We'll have to see. I don't know really how that's all going to work, but this matters a lot. It matters a lot. Uh, what I will say is I do have these donors that want to go do something and I want to be productive. I want to be helpful. I want to be a team player. I've had at least four opportunities come to me in the last few days that I'm going to explore very, very carefully about ways I can help the team ensure that we win Texas by the largest margin possible outside of RPT. Um, you know, I'd be willing to sit down with Abraham George, uh, but only if he answers the questions I asked uh, honestly, truthfully, uh, forcefully, and transparently. If he does that and has good answers, again, I'll come on this podcast with him. I'll apologize to him personally on video and we'll move forward. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to happen. I actually think he's a fraud. Um, I think he's their useful idiot. I don't think he even understands the deal he's made. And he is not going to be successful. He's never been successful in anything he's ever done. And he now has an impossible job because it's been made impossible by Alan West and Matt Rinaldi. And so every single person yeah. that's watching this, whether they like politics the way you guys do or whether they're more to the right or whatever, they should be absolutely irate at the position the Republican Party of Texas has. And let me just make sure everyone understands. The victory chair quit for the first time in party history last two weeks ago, um, having only raised about 15 percent of the budget. Um, they're going to say they raised more than that, but that's because Cruz transferred money. That's money you shouldn't spend for the last 60 days because that's the only time you can spend federal money. Yeah. The, uh, the convention operated at a loss. We'll, we'll know what the loss is in about 30 days, I suspect. They were charging children $79 to attend as guests for the first time in history. They were trying to charge reporters to attend for the first time in history. The convention was a disorganized mess. Um, the, uh, the cash on hand situation, he's lying about that. He's basically put all the convention bills forward. He's showing 1.3 million or excuse me, 2.3 2 million on hand. Florida has twice that on hand. Um, and when they pay all the convention bills, I think there's going to be about $500,000 left. And so if Abraham can't raise money, they're going to run out of money in two or three months. Now, maybe Tim Dunn and the Wilkes twins will put some money in. We'll have to see. But uh, we should be doing better than this. 
we shouldn't have to accept this kind of yeah. situation. And it's pretty clear to me, clear to me, it's gonna have to get worse before it gets better. My commitment is to do what I can do to be part of uh, the solution, to be uh, a team player, to try to help the party and help the movement and help our good candidates that are stepping up. And that's a commitment I'm going to make going forward. I wanted to do that as state chair. I wanted to deny Abraham George the chance to be chair. I endorsed Dana Myers as soon as I was out. I got the third place finisher, Weston Martinez, to endorse. I tried to encourage Mike Garcia and Ben Armenta to do the right thing. They'll tell you they did. I can tell you they didn't. They were playing games the entire time. And in the end, Dana lost 54-46 in the runoff, and that was tragic. Um, so we are where we are, um, but uh, I did everything I could. I have no regrets whatsoever. I'm proud of the race we ran in seven days. We're the only candidate to put an election integrity plan together and release it. The only candidate to put a border enforcement plan together and release it. You saw my speech for four minutes in front of the delegates. It was the most substantive, impassioned, fluid, fluent uh, remarks that anyone gave. And uh, my again, mile. Pr- pr- proud of what we did. And uh, and stay tuned because the future. It should be. Uh, the what are we staying out, tuned to, my, uh, Matt? Where's your, what's the best website or whatever the for people to follow you? Is it Twitter? Or, uh, is it is it? A, is, do you have a website or what? Yeah, three things. I'll wrap up. Thank you, Garrett. And thank you, Andy, as well. I appreciated this opportunity. I'm sorry we had some technical difficulties. What well, first, have you, Matt? Yeah, I look forward to that. So first, uh, I do a newsletter for Texas politics called Must Read Texas. It has over 90,000 subscribers, only over 40,000 views each day. The idea is to take all the news around the state, put it in a clean clear, easy to read email and delivered by 9 a.m. on every weekday. Uh, it's an incredibly popular product. There's a free one week trial. There's a free version. It costs $7 a month. Mustreadtexas.substack.com is the website. That's number one. Number two, if you're interested in helping us fight the battle in Austin, Texas, the second most democratic county, Travis County in Texas, join us at travisgop.com. All kinds of ways to get involved. Send up our emails, look for events. Uh, you can donate a small amount, anything you want to do. Finally, Garrett, you know I'm, I'm pretty prolific on Twitter. There's good and bad that comes with that. But you can follow me at Matt McCoyak. You can just put my name in on Twitter, uh, and you'll find all kinds of stuff on there. Please reach out to me. My DMs are open. My email is uh, is easy to find. Garrett knows how to reach me. And uh, I'm going to be, again, part of the solution, not part of the problem going forward. We're going to grow the party. We're going to unify the party. We're going to help candidates win. We're going to raise money. And, yes, we're going to fight for the platform and the legislative priorities next year. And I'll do that as county chair, even though I'm not going to be state chair, at least not yet. Well, Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for taking the time out. Uh, and those listening, watching, follow him on all of his stuff. You know, do his, uh, the, the must. I have I get the must read Texas uh, Substack. It's it is a must read. Um, but the more important thing, at least for me right now, is make sure you like and subscribe this video. Um, you know, got to got to plug where you can plug. Comment, follow us on comments. Twitter comments, yep, whatever, comments. Uh, YouTube and wherever you're listening on podcasts, wherever you can find it. But Matt, thank you so much for joining us and we'll definitely love to have you on in the future. Uh, but until then, we'll see y'all next week. Bye guys. You've been listening to the CN Red podcast. It's always Texas politics and beyond. We present the facts and opinions. The CN Red podcast with your host, Andy Turner and Garrett Fools. Thank you and tune in next week. And please do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode.